that this mutation is very common among most people. Is there a specific test that we can take to measure our vitamin C levels in our blood? Yes. No, it's very simple, straightforward, uh, plasma vitamin C, and uh, also uh, it's measurable in the urine very quickly by uh, a dipstick method. method. So, uh, no, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to measure. It's very, very easy to know uh, when somebody comes into a hospital, if you're interested, <laughs> hello, doctors whether your vitamin C level is low in that patient or not, because if it is low, and I'll tell you it will be low practically all the time when people enter the hospital, and especially so after they've been in the hospital for several days to weeks because nothing is done to bolster or restore vitamin C uh, when you go into the hospital these days. The only things that happen are those things that consume vitamin C, uh, infection, stress, surgery, you name it. So it could be easily checked, and even if doctors didn't want to embrace everything that I'm outlining about vitamin C, if they just went to the extent of trying to give enough vitamin C to bring that plasma or bud level back into the normal range, phenomenal things would happen for their patients. What's considered a normal range, for example, just for the audience to have a frame of reference? What do you think? Uh, that, that depends on the laboratory and the measurement factor. I, I can't give you a number off the top of my head, but... Uh, is there a window, like from such and such? Oh, yeah, sure. There's, there's a range. And as is the case with most blood tests these days, what is really normal is usually not what you see with the test because most tests, uh, under or overestimate what should be normal because, and this is interesting, scientific tests, laboratory tests are designed so that when you look at the whole population, most of the population is going to be in the normal range. So they use the people to determine the normal range rather than what's absolutely correct to determine whether it's uh, deficient or in excess in people. So uh, when you look at a lot of different blood tests, for example, people that have a lot amount of dental toxicity, uh, the mercury, root canals, and when all of that comes out of the mouth and all that toxicity is taken away from the patient, all of a sudden their lab works change and what becomes normal is a much, much tighter range rather than have a normal range of 2 to 10, if you will. The normal range up, ends up being 5 to 6 because that's how the normal population defines it. You say that high-dose vitamin C is practically a clinical miracle because it's one of the safest substances known to man and because of the things that you've mentioned in your book, all of the evidence from amputation, viral infections, HIV, AIDS, Ebola, hepatitis, pneumonia, flu, shingles, herpes, the list goes on. Have you ever had somebody say to you when you're doing your talks around the world, it can't impact all of these diseases? Well, sure. And it's very understandable that at first blush, uh, most people and most doctors would think the old uh, adage, if it's too good to be true, then it probably isn't. Well, there are exceptions to that rule. And on rare occasion, when something is too good to be true, hey, guess what? It really is. The thing about vitamin C, <clears throat> and this accounts for the title of the book, Primal Panacea, panacea basically meaning, if you look in your dictionary, a, a wide-ranging cure-all type of potion. That's what a panacea is. Vitamin C is what it is and does what it does because it's absolutely the way nature is designed to take care of stress and disease. And this is what we see in the animals. When animals get stressed, when they get challenged with infections, uh, when they eat some poison or something toxic, guess what? When their livers are working normally, all of a sudden the livers start cranking up huge amounts of vitamin C from the glucose stores inside their body. And this is how nature, primal, deals with diseases of all variety. And the reason it works with diseases of all variety is because we come right down to what is disease, what is infection, what is toxicity. And I'm going to tell you, the bottom line is that all of them, 100% of them, 
are caused by and are mediated by what's called oxidative stress. If you don't have excess oxidative stress inside your body, guess what? You don't have disease. And so to the extent that diseases come in and they produce oxidative stress, which is at a molecular level, the loss of electrons, you bring in large amounts of antioxidants, which at the molecular level are electron suppliers, then you're able to block the effects of the oxidative stress in the body. And depending on your genetic predisposition, this will mean whether or not you're having less of a tendency toward high blood pressure or cancer or heart disease or any other chronic degenerative disease, and all acute infectious processes, these all mediate their ultimate negative effects by increasing oxidative stress. And so this is why, magically, if you will, vitamin C seems to help to one degree or another just about everything. You say in the book that in the traditional delivery of vitamin C, a lot of it will be absorbed by the intestines. But because of this liposomal delivery breakthrough, it doesn't. Can you explain a little bit about the breakthrough in the delivery substance or the delivery method a little more clearly to us? Yeah, well, regular vitamin C that's not encapsulated in, micro, in, in liposomes uh, has a limited amount of absorbability. Uh, and when you start taking megagram doses, uh, 9, 10, 11 grams, you might only absorb 10% of it. When you take small amounts, 50 milligrams, 100, or even 500 milligrams, the vast majority of that is absorbed. But as you take more, you absorb less. And obviously what we're talking about here is for a lot of different disease processes, you want to get large amounts of vitamin C properly absorbed. Well, the liposomes <clears throat> is a science that's been developing for about the past 45 to 50 years uh, in which they discovered that when you had a water solution of something and you put the right type of phospholipids, which are fats, lecithin-based fats, uh, into the water and then apply the right pressure to the water, the fats ball up because they're, they don't absorb into water, and so they make little microscopic balls around what was dissolved in the solution. So if you start with a solution of vitamin C, and you can do it with many, many other things, and you properly do what needs to be done to turn these lipids into these liposomes, you end up having these super microscopic, nanoscopic, if you will, balls of fat uh, anywhere from 100 to 200 mic, uh, nan nanometers in diameter, uh, you end up with a solution filled with this. And the thing that's great about this is these little microscopic spheres of fat are so small that they can do any of a number of things. One is they're small enough to naturally pass through the pores in the cell wall. Another is the fat that's used incredibly enough, is the same type of substance that actually makes up the cell walls in the body. So sometimes the liposome will just hit a cell wall and fuse with the cell wall, become part of the cell wall, and deposit its contents inside. And all of this is even made more impressive by the fact that you're able to get vitamin C that you swallow eventually inside the cells of your body, and this is really important, without the consumption of energy. Whenever you take vitamin C in any other form and most other supplements in their regular form, they need one way or another to be taken up by an energy-consuming carrier process to get inside cells. So you end up robbing Peter to pay Paul, if you will. You end up consuming energy that's always needed to get energy-producing substances where you want them. I mean, you, it's like anything else. You can't transport anything anywhere without energy. But in the case of liposomes, just using the natural mechanisms in the body, they can pass into the cells and deliver their payloads without consuming energy in the process. And this, I believe, is why many times for acute infections, I have seen anyway, that a much smaller dose of oral 
liposome encapsulated 